very good evening to you and praise the Lord. Thank you for joining us once again for another episode of the Bible study. My name is Pastor Tim Wangi and tonight we'll be going through the book of Ezekiel chapter number 27. And this is a very technical um, scripture, but I believe that the Lord will open our eyes and he will help us to be able to fetch and analyze and interpret the scripture as it ought to be. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father and our Lord, we are grateful and thankful for this time and this moment. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to go through your word. And even tonight, we pray for insight, we pray for revelation, we pray for understanding. And above all, we pray that every detail of this text and context will be revealed unto us. Thank you for everyone that is watching and those that will watch. And thank you for their audience. And it is in Jesus' name that we have prayed and believed. So we are continuing with the judgment of the city of Tyre. This began from chapter number 26. It will continue in chapter number 27 and it will culminate in chapter number 28. When we begin to look at some of these prophecies, they carry some level of parallelism or what we call biblical resemblance. Some of the words being used even in chapter 27 of Ezekiel is also available in the pages of Revelation, especially chapter number 18, when the judgment of great Babylon is being announced. And there are people who have laid out some of these scriptures as apocalyptic scriptures or scriptures that tend to merge and tend to have a consistency in the conversation of the end time narration. And the book of Ezekiel, even as we go towards other pages, becomes a very technical book when it comes to the apocalyptic writing and even the millennial reign of the Messiah. And chapter 27, we are going to divide it into three. But just to help you understand it, the overview is that this is what we call a lamentation or what in ancient um, Phoenician languages, the Far East culture used to call a funeral dirge or a song that used to be sung during a funeral. So this is basically a lamentation and a very sorrowful kind of conversation because it's about the falling of the city of Tyre. But the prophet takes a, a very serious um, metaphorical and poetic uh, way of writing and that's what makes the text a little bit complex. But the moment you are able to decode the poetry in the writing, the text becomes very clear. The context of uh, Ezekiel 27 is the city of Tyre, which was a commercial and a military city, a maritime city. It was next uh, to the sea. Uh, the, 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 the author uses a metaphorical and poetic language to typify the city as a ship. So the conversation here is that Poetically, the city of Tyre is being described as a ship. And then we come to see the engagements that the city has had and finally the judgment. So when we divide it into three, we see there is this magnificent ship that has been made with these magnificent, magnificent materials and the beauty, the majesty and the, the conspicuousness of this ship makes it stands out and this becomes the foundation of its pride. But later we see the nations that became uh, builders and also partnered with this particular ship or city, they are mentioned, but later the ship is released in the sea and the ship is stricken by the eastern waves and it crashes and capsizes, which to the amazement of many was a surprise because of the networks politically, because of his military prowessness, and also because of his glory and glamour. And the core theme of Ezekiel 27 is what happens when materialism is exalted, our hearts are lifted, 
and sometimes and not most of the times pride becomes the order of the day. So I've just given you an analysis so that even as we go to the technical reading, you're able to understand that Tyre has been type typified of being a ship made of very expensive materials, the nations that partner with Tyre and the crushing of this particular ship. So I'm going to read from, uh, from verse 1. Uh, all the way to verse 11. The Bible says, I'm reading from, N, uh, from NKJV. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, Now, son of man, take up a lamentation for Tyre and say to Tyre, You who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchants of the people on many coast lands, thus says the Lord God. O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the midst of the sea. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They made all your plants of fir tree from senir. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make you a mast. Of ox from Bashan, they made your oars. The company of Asherites have inlaid your plants with ivory from the coast of Cyprus, fine embroidered linen from Egypt, was what you spread for your sail. Blue and purple from the coast of Elisha uh, was what covered you. Inhabitants of Sidon and Avad were your horsemen. Your wise men, O Tyre, were in you. They became your pilots. Elders of Gebal and its wise men were in you to court your seams, all the sheep of the sea, and their horsemen were in you to market your merchandise. Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. They hung shields and helmets in you. They gave splendor to you, to, to you. Men of Arvad with your army were on your walls all around, and the men of Gamad were on your towers. They hung their shield on your walls all around. They made your beauty perfect. So when we look at the first phase from... Uh, verse 1 all the way to verse 11, the opening of the verse is a lamentation. Um, and this is, in this lamentation, it commences, number one, with a picture of glory that was upon the city of Tyre. And also the architectural beauty and its military strength and defense. So that is what opens up between verse 1 all the way to verse 11. It is the beauty of the city, the architectural design, the defense mechanism. And of course, this already creates a mental picture. But as I said, um, this one is typified by uh, the city is also given a poetic symbolism of a ship. So this is a lamentation. Um, and, and, and in this lamentation, we don't begin with lamentation. We, I mean, we don't begin with the sorrow. We begin by portraying the beauty of how significant this be beautiful sea was. I said here the city of Tyre was a very strategic commercial town. And in chapter 26, we realized that the reason why they celebrated the downfall of Jerusalem is because Jerusalem controlled the inland trade. But the city of Tyre controlled the sea trade. So anytime they took their goods to the inland, um, they had to share the spoils, the tolls, and the taxes with Jerusalem. So when Jerusalem fell, they felt like the borders have been opened, and now we must enjoy the spoils of business alone. So at this time, we are given also not only was their era celebrating the fall of Jerusalem, but their era was pride because of the perfection of their beauty. And these particular verses, uh, we begin to see how magnificent the city was. Um, you know, the architectural, the positioning, the commerce, and all that. And this is what made the city to take pride. You have said, I'm perfect in beauty. Uh, it begins here, say to Tyre, you who are situated at the entrance of the sea, merchants of the people on many coastlands. That says the Lord, of course, have gone around that. Uh, the city of Tyre was situated on the marine. Uh, uh, it was a marine, maritime city and very heavy on commerce. 
and, and, and you know, it controlled a lot of business. But pride began to enter because of beauty. And the description we begin to see of this Ezekiel is that Tyre is a large, beautiful merchant ship. And, and you know, uh, this one became the ground for the, the prominence and dominance of its power and also its pride. Naturally, the ancient ship in the olden days used to have around 50 horsemen. The horsemen are the people who row the boat. So the, 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 the ship used to have around 50. But as, the, as, the, as, the, as technology evolved, this is historical data, the people developed a ship that had 200 horsemen. These were so many people. That means the ship was also very big. And, 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 and these were considered to be state-of-the-art ship. And it is believed, possibly Ezekiel picks part of this very magnificent state-of-the-art ship and talks about it. You remember when the Titanic was made, it became one of the magnificent, uh, you know, ship globally. And one of the things that they had mastered was the safety of the Titanic. And I remember they said, the creator of Titanic said, this ship, even God himself, cannot cause it to drown. But when it was at the sea, it encountered um, an iceberg and it drowned in a manner that no ship has ever drowned of its magnitude. So when we look at this, we are looking at a prophet trying to pick an image of their day that they all knew. Like uh, nowadays we have the cruise ship. So he's talking about this magnificent ship that were being now created in the territories of Tyre, whereby they had 200 horsemen. These were the people, you know, uh, they were rowing the, the ship at that particular time. And when you continue, we begin to see the raw material that was being made. Uh, because it says here, your border are in the midst of the sea. Your builders have perfected your beauty. They made all your plants of fir tree from senir. Um, this was very expensive tree, and most of it were found from Mount Hamon. And these regions, they had some of the best pine and cypress trees, and very strong cedar. Uh, these are just types of trees. And you know, Lebanon is majorly mentioned here because you always find the cedars from Lebanon. Uh, so we begin to see the raw materials that were used to make this uh, particular city were very expensive. And coming from the very places that mattered, you know, uh, they took cedar from Lebanon to make you a mast of ox from Bashan. They made you your oars. The company of Asherites have laid inlaid of your planks with ivory from the coast of Cyprus. So different nations that did business and that helped build the economy of attire are mentioned here. So we begin to see the magnificent of this particular city typified as a ship. The many parts that are mentioned here, these are the different parts of a ship that these woods were used to make this part, and these woods came from this particular nation, these woods came from this part, and these woods were used from this particular nation. On the floor, it's overlaid with ivory. Ivory was a very prestigious uh, kind of thing in those particular days. And then we begin to see fine embroidered linen from Egypt was what you spread for your say. Blue and purple from the coast of Elishash was what you covered you. So we begin to see the magnificent because these were very expensive ma materials that were being used uh, in these um, uh, days because linen was available in Egypt and, uh, and linen was considered as royal garment. This was not just garment that ordinary people used to use or buy. It was very expensive and it was considered to be its royal garment. And then you begin to see in this city, typified as a ship, men are able to lay linen just as kawaida, uh, you know, vitambas in that particular ship. So the core business here is Ezekiel painting the beauty, architectural design, the magnificent, the opulence of the city of Tyre. Again, the second thing that he's trying to bring on board is the many nations that were involved and the many transactions that Tyre did with different nations. This must have been a serious economic hub. 
And because of this, of course, their pride was raised. And, you know, um, possibly they felt like they were immortals. When you go from verse 8, uh, inhabitants of Sidon and Avad were your horsemen. Uh, strong men from Sidon, Avad, these were neighbors that were in the areas near the city of Tyre. These were the sheep rowers, that name horsemen. These were the sheep rowers. And then we begin to see that they also had the wise men. And, and these wise men uh, became the people who were the pilots um, uh, uh, that were uh, running this particular uh, ship. Now, what does this bring on board? It means that the quality of their laborers was the best. They had the best people working for them. When I look at this for me, it's like, you know, when you go to modern day Dubai, you realize that they have the best investors, they have the best, they hire the best. And, and this begins to show us that inhabitants of Sidon Abad where you are Osman, these are the ones who made, they, they were the ones rowing, they're the ones who made the ship move. Your wise men of Tyre were new. They became your pilots. These were the ones who gave control and navigation. Elders of Gebal and its wise men were in you to, to, to count your sea seams, um, all the sheep of the sea. And their horsemen were in you to market your merchandise. So we begin to see here that there is detailed description of every lavish detail of the trading vessel that they were using. And this, of course, was to represent the city of Tyre and, of course, to show that it was much less perfect and you couldn't compare it with anyone. And then from verse 10 to 11, we begin to see famous mercenaries or men of war uh, who came from distant lands, came on board. So it was also not just a business hub, but it was also a security hub. It attracted warriors to fight for her uh, because she was very strong. And also the outstanding men of Tyre were traders, not soldiers. So we begin to see there was security from outside. Those from Persia, Lydia, and Libya were in your army as men of war. Um, they gave splendor to you. Men of Avad with your army were on your walls all around. And the men of Gamad were in your towers. They hung their shield on your wall all around. They made your beauty perfect. So we see this magnificent city typified as a ship. We also see the quality of their laborers. And we also see the quality of their warriors and defense system. It was an economic hub and also a serious military base. If you were to look at it with natural eyes, then ideally not only was it beautiful, but it was very secure. So the prophet must begin by showing the details of this city before we even come to the prophecy, the lamentation of the destruction. This was a superpower. It looked like it was not going to go down. And then <clears throat> when you go to beginning from chapter 27, sorry, from verse 12 all the way to 24, it brings the extent of tire commercial uh, extension. And many nations are mentioned here and the kind of businesses that they did together. So you realize this was a very significant town. So many nations from 12 to 24 will go through them. Every verse has at least one or two nations that did business with Tyre and the kind of materials that they provided to this great city. So we begin. So Tashish was your merchant because of your many luxury good. So we'll see, and Tashish was at the western end of the Mediterranean. And this was possibly modern day southern Spain or Sardinia. This could be the place. And they gave these minerals. Tashish, maybe southern of Spain today, uh, because of your, they gave you, they gave silver, they gave iron, they gave tea, and they gave lead. So it looked like majority of their metals, whatever they needed, they did business with Tashish. So that's where they got their metals from. Then we come to um, what is now called here Javan. Javan, Tubal, and Meshech. 
were your traders. And these ones were responsible for bringing slaves. And Javan here is Greek. J Javan is, is in Greece. And Tubal and Meshek both are in eastern Anatolia. Now we need a whole map just to get where they are. But forget the positions. What these two nations did, um, they purchased goods from Tyre in exchange of human uh, human slaves and also vessels of bronze. That's what is here. Javan, Tubal, and Meshek were your traders. They butter, they buttered human lives and vessels of bronze for your merchandise. So it was a butter trade. They they gave them slaves and bronze vessels, um, and and you know as they got whatever they needed from them. Then those from the house of um, Tog Togarma traded for your wear, wares with horses, steeds, and mules, the men of... The, so, so the people of uh, Togarma, or Beth Togarma, that's 14, um, from the house of Togarma, is also called Beth Togarma, traded for your wares. These are people of Armenia. And what they did is that they gave mules and horses, including war horses, for Tyre, for tire wares. So these ones, that's the kind of business that they did. Remember, from 12 to 24, we are looking at the vastness of his commerce and business network. And so we come now to the other city, which is Dadan, uh, the city of Dedan, where your traders, many isos were their market of your hand. They brought you ivory tusks and ebony as payment. So this city of Dada, the Dadanites, uh, they lived in Arabia. Uh, and, and they live along the Persian Gulf. And what they brought is that uh, they brought ivory and, and they brought ebony. These, these are woods. And, and so that's the kind of business they did. And then we go now to the other city. Um, Syria was your merchant because of the abundance of goods you made. They gave you for your wares emeralds, purple embroidery, fine linen, corals and rubies. So there was a transaction of a few minerals and also clothes with Syria. Judah, that's another city that they did business with. And the land of Israel were your traders. They traded for your merchandise, wheat of minute, millet, honey, oil, and balm. So that is what the business they did with Judah. They got food from them. Damascus was your merchandise because of abundance of goods you made because of many luxury items. And so they gave them wine and of hellborn and with white wool. So they provided wool and they provided wine. That was Damascus. Dan and Javan paid for your wares. Traversing back and forth, wrought iron, cashier, cashier and cane were among your merchandise. So that's what they did um, um, with Dan and Javan. The Dan was your merchandise in saddle cloths. These are the clothes used for uh, the horses for riding. Arabia and all princes of Kedar were your regular merchants. They traded with you in lambs, rams, and goats, animals. This is food. The merchants of Sheba and Ramah were your merchants. They traded for your wares. They traced spice, all kind of precious stones, and gold. So we begin, there was also spices and gold, minerals, haram, Kane, Eden, the merchants of Sheba, Assyria, and Chilman were your merchants. These were your merchants in choice items, in purple clothes, in embroidery garments, in chest of multicolored apparel, in study woven cords, which were in your marketplace. Now, many nations have been mentioned, and there was trade with Tyre with different nations. It's automatic that Tyre was a very luxurious city and a very wealthy city and a well-built well, well -built city architecturally. The details of everything I've read is just to show you the, the kind of trade that that nation did with other nations. Just like in Kenya today, we do a lot of business with many nations. We do a lot of business with many nations. We do business, I think globally, there is what we export, there is what we import. And looking at the globe today, when we look at a nation like China, is one of the biggest economically. And China is doing big.
business with everyone and their economy is very stable. And for me, I'm just trying to give that very practical example so that in your mind, you can understand what Ezekiel 27 is talking about. So the first level is that the architectural and the military uh, prowessness and beauty and design is described as a ship. Then the second level, we come to the commerce network that was upon the city, meaning that this was a very stable economy, if we use that language today. It was a very strategic city. It had what we call political networks, and it had all these alliances, and it had wealth in its midst, and it bought a lot of luxurious things from other nations. So when any other nation looked at them, this was a very powerful state, and maybe nobody would even have thought that one day this nation will even collapse. It would have been imaginable for anyone to even think about it. But when we come now to from, from verse 25 going down, it is the sinking of the great ship. This is where now the details of judgment begin to appear. I said for us to understand this lamentation, or what we call the funeral dirge, or a song that is performed in a funeral, uh, we must divide it into three. The first segment is given and typified as a ship. We understand the architectural magnificent, and we also understand the military and the defense system that was upon it. The second one is for us to understand the economic network and framework that was upon the city. But now it is the sinking and the crushing of the great ship which nobody ever thought that it could ever collapse. The same way today in our day, we look at certain economies and we cannot even imagine that some nations can even go down or even collapse. And from verse 27, your riches wears, I mean from verse 25, the ship of Tashish were, were carriers of your merchandise. You are filled and very, very glorious in the midst of the sea. Now you can see again, we've gone back to the, I mean, poetic symbolism of Tyre being like a ship. So this is a loaded ship, a beautiful ship. You look at the, 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 those, uh, those vitambas, they are made of linen of Egypt. The floor is made of ivory. This does not just look like an ordinary ship transporting goods. This is a very magnificent ship. Your horsemen brought you into many waters. So the ship has entered into very deep terrains, areas that ordinary ship cannot enter. Remember the horsemen. The horsemen, these are the people who row the boat. They have managed to take it from the shallow waters and to the deep waters. This is great achievement for a ship of this magnitude. And then the Bible says, but the east wind broke you in the midst of the sea. The east wind, what was the east wind? This is Babylon. The east wind is Babylon because Babylon besieged, and we spoke about that in chapter 26, Babylon besieged Tyre for 13 years and launched an attack and brought Tyre down. And we said, of course, there were successful, successive attacks as it was prophesied just as the wave rises, there were waves of attack. After Babylon attacked, they rebuild. The Middle Persia again attacked, they rebuild. The Greece attacked, they rebuild. The Romans attacked. And today, when you go to the areas of Lebanon, Tyre is not a city that is celebrated as it was a super city back in the days of 580s BC. So we begin to see this. Your riches, wares, and merchandise your mariners and pilots, your calculars and merchandisers, all your men of war who are in you and the entire company which is in your midst will fall into the midst of the sea on that day of your ruin. The language here, when you're in the middle of the sea and you are attacked and the vessel is destroyed, the language is automatically that vessel will capsize or drown. And high chances are that lives may not be saved. So Ezekiel speaking to people that live in a marine setup, they understand exactly what this dodge is all about. You see, the Bible uses languages that are common to us. I want to believe if Jesus was to speak to us in Kenya or even God, he will still use themes that are known to us. 
if I come from Kiambu, he will use the things, like here there's a lot of tea and a lot of coffee. The, he will use such things, you know, to explain mysteries of the kingdom. And so he's using this example of the sheep. And, you know, sometimes in Bible interpretation, they say um, sometimes the understanding of the Bible becomes technical. Because you can imagine I'm reading about very detailed sea vessels, but I live in the mainland. So if a man is reading this and they've never lived next to the sea, it doesn't make sense. But if a person who has lived next to the sea reads this verse, many things when he hear the horseman, the pilot, already knows what they are talking about. And, and so that's why sometimes we read the Bible and there are things we don't understand simply because of our setting and also our location. In fact, they were saying, sometimes it becomes very hard to interpret even the Bible because when the Bible says, and God will make your sins as white as snow. Now imagine you're trying to explain that to a person living in Baringo, which is very hot and they have never seen snow. But you see, the children of Israel knew snow. So what, what is white in their terrain? Milk is white. So you can tell them and God will purify you and make you as white as milk because the concept here is purity. So please, when we get this conversation of sheep and all that, uh, we who are on the mainland may not understand of this, but um, I believe the Holy Spirit will open our eyes. So he says that, you know, when there is a casualty, when people crash in the middle of the sea, very few people survive. The common land will shake at the sound of the cry of your pilots because you have an amazing opulent vessel. You have the best laborers. You have the best horsemen and best pilots. Nobody will believe that you can crash. Nobody will believe. All who handle the oar, the mariners, all the pilots of the sea will come down from their ship and stand on the shore. They will make their voice heard because of you. They will cry bitterly and cast darts on their heads. They will roll about in ashes. They will shave themselves completely bald because of you. Guard themselves with sackcloth and weep for you with bitterness of heart and bitterness wailing. Now this is where the dodge comes in. This is where the lamentation, the cry comes in. That your fall will be greater and people will enter into a very great mourning. In their wailing for you, they will take up a lamentation and lament for you what cities like Tyre, destroyed in the midst of the sea. What people knew is that whatever God destroyed in the middle of the sea could not be recovered. That was a reality. Um, you saw this thing that some people died and they disappeared as they were going to look for the ruins of the Titanic. Whatever is destroyed in the midst of the sea can never even be brought on the shore. It is over it will perpetually remain under the sea. And this is a very serious dodge and judgment and lamentation uh, basically being pronounced by Ezekiel. When your wares went out by sea, you satisfied many people. You enriched the kings of the earth with your many luxury goods and your merchandise. But you are broken by the sea in the depth of the waters. Your merchandise and the entire company will fall in your midst. All the inhabitants of the isles will be astonished at you. Their kings will be greatly afraid and their countenance will be troubled. Why will these kings be afraid and countenance troubled? Number one, many nations will lose a very significant business partner. Many nations will lose a very significant business partner. Also, many nations will not understand how such a serious economy could collapse and how such a very well-protected, luxurious, magnificent city could enter into the levels of judgment. The merchants among the people will hiss at you. You will become a horror and be no more forever. Of course, by the judgment of Tyre, a message will be sent also to the remaining territories about who Yahweh is and who God is. That, of course, was going to be communicated among the territories of the people. And the falling of this city is also a picture that no matter how strong economies may look like, no matter how strong people may look like, at the end of the day, there is no, nothing that can never fall or collapse. When I look at the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 27, for me, two lessons are coming here very clearly. 
And I believe as we go to 28, it's going to climax and culminate to a very glorious end. The first one is that many times we can never put our trust in our material possession. Our trust ought to be in the Lord. And many times when we trust so much in what we believe, pride is inevitable. Pride is inevitable. And pride will blind you even to warnings that are given from heaven. And sometimes it's easy to hold onto things and think I'm okay. I rather hold onto Jesus because he can never sink. The second thing is also to be sensitive. Even when God judges man, it looks like it's not in our place to celebrate or even look like and say, wow, God is really moving in judgment because Tyre was judged because they celebrated the fall of Jerusalem. So it's a question of interrogating ourselves and our hearts in our walk and especially in matters pride. And it's also is a question of just being reminded that God is God and no matter your material success, anyone can always come down. We bless the Lord for this and I know we are learning. Tomorrow we'll look at uh, um, 28, which is the judgment speech uh, of this particular um, um, uh, nation of Tyre and Sidon. And then after that, we'll go to the judgment of Egypt, again, which took 29 all the way to 32. Looks like there was so much focus on these two nations, Tyre and Egypt, and we're going to learn a lot. Father, we bless you and we thank you. And Lord, any area where we have fallen short of your glory, areas where we feel like pride has already taken over, material success is not a problem, but sometimes it's when we are possessed by these blessings and we begin to value them even above your relationship. Lord, tonight I pray that as we have seen how Tyre fell, it is evident that no nation, no economy, and no city is above you. And you can always move in judgment to humble them that have exalted themselves in pride. Thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. So thank you very much. Remember, you can always give an offering. The giving details are there, 8017370 and 0726714. Every collection for this Bible study is our sponsorship and facilitation for our high school missions. God bless you.